Victoria. So I want you to, for today, just for a moment, just imagine for a moment a world, not a world, I want to say your world, but I want to ask you to imagine your world in a moment without any worries or without any needs, that whatever is needed by you, that it is provided and that there is no worries for you. Imagine just for a moment that um, not that there isn't trouble around you, but that anxiousness isn't there around the things in your life. When I started imagining that, I, I feel, I don't know about you, but I think it's the same with you. It's a little bit difficult to imagine a world like that. You know, we all would say we have our worries and we all have our concerns and we all are in need the whole time and so on. But I think that is maybe one of the problems for us as church is that we, we tend to, or we got so used to in the culture and in the day and especially even in church to have this language that speaks about, you know, we still, all of us are worried and, you know, there are needs and things like that and, you know, there's not always peace and so on. But I believe when it comes to the God that we serve, that he wants to give us victory even right now. You know, it's, it's, it's so scary to think that in our world, and, and especially even in church, you know, we, we tend to especially think about just one day, and just saying, Lord Jesus, please just come back now. And we know we're in the last days. We know that, and we can see the tension of the last days. And we also believe that God did a great thing at the beginning. But somehow, in the middle, we are struggling to live a victorious life. But I want to tell you the same God... Is God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that provided in, with peace and with everything at the beginning, and the same God that will be there at the end is right here, right now with us. And you know what? I think we have gotten so used to a language of, you know, saying, but, you know, we, we, we're going through the motions, but one day... It will be completed, and we do understand that. Uh, but I also want to say that right now, God wants to give us peace, and he wants to give us abundantly what we need. He promises that right now. So I want to talk to you today, and want to start today talking to you about walking in victory. Walk in victory. And especially on the field of your finances. Because you know what? That's the one thing that is really, uh, I want to say, bring tension in our homes and in our own hearts is finances. The one thing that keep people awake at night is their finances and God's provision for you. But I believe that, you know, the Bible tells us that he will look after us and he is the same yesterday today and forever and like he looked after the Israelites and the early church he's still looking after us but I think we've gotten so used to a language even in church that says you know what but the Bible says we we're going to go through difficult times and yes it is like that but the Bible never tells us that God's not going to provide in areas that we need there's no scripture where God says, there's going to be times where I'm not going to provide what you need. And, but I think we've gotten so used to a certain language for ourselves. Yes, the world is at, at a place where it is difficult, but I think that more so for us as, as followers of Jesus Christ, I believe God wants to raise our faith level especially in these times, because God wants to use all of us in this era right now for his kingdom, for his work, and that's what he wants to do. And I believe that when it comes to walking in victory, there's two things that the Bible speaks about that, that is actually the two legs that we walk on, especially when it comes to provision and what God provides and those two legs 
is stewardship and generosity. That's the two. There's a stewardship that what God has given to us, we've got to steward it and we've got to do, uh, use it in the right way and in the right manner. But God also wants us to be generous. The one cannot go without the other. Some people just give away everything and they forget that God wants you to steward it in a good way. Some other people would just keep it and steward it just like for themselves and forget to be generous. But God wants us to do those two together. There's actually a scripture in the Bible in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 that says, and I forgot to read this to you now, but, but it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. If you want to know how we walk, we walk in a life of victory. We walk by faith. And I believe that that faith as we're walking is one leg is stewardship and the other leg is generosity. And for a couple of weeks, yes, we've got on the 12th, we've got the, that uh, day of feast. And then um, there's a couple of other things that might be happening. But for a couple of weeks, I really want to talk to you about this. Walking in victory and even especially with our finances because it is one of our greatest worries. And God doesn't want us to worry about it. You know, there's a, there's a, a very well-known parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 25 that, that is something that I read regularly to remind me of uh, God's heart for me, but also my responsibility in this. Matthew 25, and you will not find the scriptures there, but I want to read you just a couple of, um, a couple of verses here. But this is where Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man that, um, that was traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to the one he gave five, and to the other one he gave two, and to the other one he gave one. To each one according to his ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he tells what, what the guys did, and there are so many beautiful lessons from here. But then in verse eight, uh, 19 it says, After a long time the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. You know, and I read this this these verses quite regularly because um, you can just take down that slide for now. But I, I read these verses regularly because the thing is that the Bible actually says it's a man that entrusted money to different, different people and then he went off to a far country and then he came back and he's taking account of it. And church, I want to tell you, I am reminded of it regularly, and I remind myself, and I want to remind you today that we are all going to give account into what God has given to you. He is coming back, and I want to tell you, He's going to make you give account of what you have done with what was entrusted to you. It's interesting in the story it shows something of the faithfulness of the individuals. Different individuals were so faithful. It says that God gave according to their ability. Now, some might think this is, and for many years, I thought, you know, this is really unfair of God. You know, the one he gave five, the other one he gave two, and the other one he gave one. And you know why we think it is unfair? Because God created us in the first place. And when he created us, you know, we, we think that, okay, according to my ability, okay, so the one is five and the one is two and the one is one. But one thing that the scholars write about is they say the one thing that we do forget in the story, that when this man went away on his journey, that these men that he entrusted his money to, was already working for him for some time. So when the Bible says that he gave according to their ability, they already had a track record of their faithfulness to what was entrusted to them. 
according to their ability, was a track record that was already built up. So the guy that got five already was stewarding in a good way. The guy that got two was stewarding already in a good way. Because the master saw what they did. They already had a track record. Maybe you've got to ask yourself, what is your track record? Because the master entrusted, what did he entrust? He entrusted what was his to those servants. He gave what was his to the servants. It wasn't theirs. It wasn't theirs to keep. He gave it to them and he left it. And then he came back and he asked them, what did you do with it? I just remembered now, after the service, I actually thought about it because I think, you know, especially when it comes to our faith, I was thinking about it even in this group now, but after the service, I actually got to fill my car again with petrol. And um, I think it might be, I need to run about 800 rand. And I was just thinking if there's anybody here that would give me that money. I wonder if there's anybody that would just, would you give me that money? Ah, did he? Wow. How much is it? 800. Sure. Thanks so much, Didi. Okay. Now, now I know some of you are stunned and having goosebumps about this. But the reason why Didi came so quickly was because I gave my money to him before the time. <laughs> it's actually my money. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Now, Didi had a choice this morning. You know, he could have just said now for a moment, I know Harry gave me the money and he's going to call, call me out, but, but you know, at some point he might need it. But uh, I said to him before the time, I said, at some point I'm going to ask you for the money. And I think it is the same with God. He's giving it to us. And then at some point he's saying, I, I might be asking you for what I have provided for you because I might need it to do something somewhere for my kingdom and for my work. And God is calling us to that. And we are actually in a big way, well, this is exactly like it is. So did he add the opportunity? He could have just ignored my voice, just said, I didn't hear that, and decided to run out the door and go and use it, or just decided to go to the the machine here and buy a couple of chips and stuff and so on and but he brought it because he knew it wasn't his you see I think for us the most important thing before as we go in this journey of stewardship and and generosity we have to start right here that everything belongs to God everything belongs to God there's nothing that doesn't belong to him. See, I've got a couple of scriptures, but there's so many others that are saying that. And Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Leviticus 25, 23, The land is mine, and you are but aliens and tenants. Um, 1 Chronicles 29, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor 
comes from you, you are the ruler of all things. Job, Job has got a very interesting story and he went through very difficult times, but God woke him up and said, Job, you have no clue what you're talking about. If you understand who I am, if you know who I am, you were not there when I made the earth. You were not there when I put the boundaries in place. And in Job 40, uh, it says, Job 41 verse 11, Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under the heavens belongs to me. Psalm 24, David writes and he says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who lives in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And the, the, those are just a couple of verses, but if there's one thing that, that Israel understood, if there's one thing that they reminded themselves of, if there's one thing that they got stuck to is this, that every single thing belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to Him. David said it. Paul said it. The early church said it. They knew it. It was part of their DNA to understand that no power in this world rules over certain things and has everything. It's only God that has everything. The God that we serve. It is Him. He's got everything. And I think for us to walk in stewardship and to walk in generosity, uh, God wants to live our faith. We've got to live our faith to understand that He is in control of everything. Because the moment we start realizing that, it will become easier to understand when we must spend, where we must spend, how we should do, what we should do. But we have to put on the glasses of knowing that it all belongs to Him. You know, you might be sitting here and thinking, okay, I understand. The heavens belongs to him and those things belong to him. But at least, you know, when it comes to myself, you know, it, I, I, I've got myself. I, I must do it myself. But Paul even writes this. He says, no, 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 I want you to understand that you are not even your own. You have been bought with a price. You are his. And church, I want to tell you, that I think in this day and age, we, we, have, we have started to believe so many lies. And we are so concerned and we are so worried. But God wants to use us for His kingdom and for His glory. Yes, I know that there are difficult times and I understand it. The Bible says in the last days that those things will happen. But the Bible also says that in the last days He will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. The Bible also says that. But we have made our own assumptions even about that. And I think, you know, the Bible never, nowhere says that with followers of Jesus Christ, they're going to be in need the whole time in the last days. The Bible never says, you know, that we're just not going to have anything. The Bible tells us that we are more needed right now than ever before. It is through our lives and it's in our lives that God wants to spread His gospel message everywhere. And the problem with us is that we, 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 we fall into this trap. We fall into this trap where we as followers of Jesus Christ have, have become so uh, I want to say fearful and anxious and stuff in this world, that our number one prayer is, Jesus, just come back, please, because we're not sure about what's happening anymore. But this, is the, this is the thing, church, is I understand how we feel about it, but Peter writes it and he says, God isn't delaying because he doesn't know what he's doing. No, he's delaying because he still wants people to be saved. While you are here, God wants to use you and work through you to win people for him. That's what he wants to do. He wants to use you. And he's going to resource you. He's going to resource us. He's going to give to us so that... We can spread his message. That's what it's all about. 
If our time on earth is up, it's up. Then we've got to leave. Then we're going. But we're still here. God still wants to do it through us. And I, and I want to show you, you know, I, I think it is so important for us to be open to say, Lord, I want to be a good steward and I want to be John and generous in everything that I do. Because God is going to use men and women like that in this era. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. Because God, if, if he has to entrust his resources for his kingdom to anybody, he will entrust it to somebody that is faithful in stewardship and faithful in generosity in this era so that his kingdom can be seen. He is in control. Everything belongs to him. Nothing will stop him. Nothing will stop him. So, you might be saying, Harry, okay, that's great. We know that he's in control. So what should I do then? Now, I've, I want to show you something just quickly. Because I believe that what we should do is, I think that we should, at the end of the day, focus on him and lean on him. I, for a moment, can't remember what was the words that I put on here, but I want to say this. Don't live in the middle. Don't live in the middle. If you want to know what you should do now that you know that you've got one leg that's stewardship and for you to walk in victory, you've got one leg of generosity, then I think in this era, more than ever, we shouldn't be living in the middle. You see, this represents, you know, walk, climbing the ladder of God. If we want to climb the ladder of God, and we want to, you know, we all, we all have this, this feeling of we really want to do something for God with greatness. We all want to climb this greatness ladder. And we should do that. You know, I, I, think, I think it is important for us. And, you know, we say, Lord... I want to climb this ladder. I want, to, I want to be with you. You're my God. You're my Savior. And we are climbing this ladder. But here's the thing. I saw this illustration. So I want to say it's not originally even from me. But take it because it's very good. But here's the thing. As we're climbing this ladder, we have gotten used to a kind of a language and kind of a belief system in our thinking that, that still connects us with the worldly ladder. And we're standing on the one side saying, Lord, I, I want to follow you, but on the other side, I want to lean towards you, but on the other side, uh, I just want to, you know, there's just a couple of things, you know, that's still in my life. And you know, that, that's even the problem with when we, when we say, do you want to give your life to Jesus? There's a problem with that, okay? And we all do it, and I've prayed it with you, but there's one thing that I've realized. The, the problem with that is, is that we do that. We say, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus, so I'm just putting up one more step, okay? But... In the same time, while I'm, living, uh, I'm giving my heart to Jesus, I'm also standing on this side. Now, the Bible says that, that Jesus is the bridegroom and we're the bride. And I, and I want you to see how we've taught ourselves a language of standing in the middle. Imagine for a moment the day when I asked Vinette to marry me, you know. If she said to me, you know what, Gary, it's so great, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you're, you're my lover. I, I really want to be with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. And you see, it's getting scary here, you know. And, and, and you, you're the one. But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, and I'm going to, uh, uh, there was a, a high school sweetheart. Let's just call him Peter. Gary, I had a high school sweetheart. She didn't have a Peter, but I just want to say this. Uh, and, and you know what? I'm still just a little bit attached to him. So if you don't mind, I'm going to, you know, I really love you. But if you don't mind, just, just give me one week a year with him. 
That's not much to ask. 52 weeks, 51's yours. Just one week. Just one week. Oh, and you know what, Gary? And then something else. But you know, you know, we all make mistakes. You know, we all, ah, Lord, we really, you know, Gary, I, I love you. I, I really, I promise you, you're the one. You're the main one. But I've also been in a relationship for some time with George. Now, George, the thing is, the thing is, it's not that I don't, you know, I really want to be with you. But you know how it is. It's very difficult to just leave George. You know, so if you don't mind, you know, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes, so don't mind me. But maybe for a couple of years, you know, I'm really trying I'm really trying to get rid of this relationship, but, my, but for a couple of years, please just, just bear with me. You know, I'm working through it. I'm really working through it. So, so if I, you know, just spend lots of time with George, just, just bear with me. And, and I know you will, Harry, because you love me. You asked me to marry you, and I really want to love you. But just, you know, if I make a mistake with George, forgive me. I will never say yes to her. I will never get into a relationship like that. No man would get into a relationship like that. And no woman would get into a relationship like that. But why have we taught ourselves that language when it comes to Jesus? We have taught ourselves a language that says, you know, we all make mistakes. Oh, you know what, Harry, it's, it's really, I, I, yes, yes, today I get goosebumps. I want to be with Jesus. Pray for me. You know, another invitation. What a sermon. Great. Touches my heart, you know. And then Sunday, I'm singing, Jesus, all for Jesus. And Monday morning, I'm just, <laughs> George, all for George. Sorry for George. I don't know a George. But then I'm on this side. Then I'm on this side. And we cannot be living in, in the middle like this. We cannot live in the middle like this. And let's be honest. Your worries about the economy and what is happening in the world and so on. Let, let's be honest. The Bible actually says very little about what's going to happen in the economy of the world. There is a couple of things. But he talks about earthquakes and he talks about wars and stuff. But he doesn't say much about the economy. So let me tell you something. We are actually, our worries is because of what the world is saying. Because the world is telling you next year is going to be an economic crisis. The world is telling you a lot of stuff about the finances. And that's why, you know, I thought, you know, people are saying, well, the church talks about money and so on. But I want to say, I think we're talking too little about it. Maybe that's a problem. It's because all the information that is making you so anxious comes from the world. It's not coming from the church. And at the end of the day, we cannot be in the middle God wants you to choose. You know, Revelation puts it like this. Revelation, Jesus says to the, to the church, he says, if you were just cold or hot, but now that you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. What well, Jesus is saying, you've got to decide. And, you know, we all are trying to get up the ladder. We're, we're saying, oh, but I can't understand it. Why can't I live in victory? It feels like I'm just going up one step, but it's so scary. And I feel, and, and now I'm, the reason is because we're standing on both sides. Do you still believe? Do you still believe that the God that has, owes it all, that has it all, he has the final say? So if God leads you into something for next year, don't just give your ears to whatever is some people saying about the economy. It is about what God 
is saying. He leads, He provides. But I believe, church, that we are believing a lot of nonsense. We have started to believe a lot of nonsense and we're trying to justify it with our own nice sentences in this. But God is in control. Do we still believe that? Do you really still believe that? We sing it, but we don't live it. And I'm not asking you even, you know, do you sing it loudly? I'm not asking you, do you say it while we're here? I'm asking you, two o'clock in the morning when you're awake, when you don't know where to go or what to turn and what is going on in your life and what the future holds, and do you believe then? It's a trust in Him. It's a trust in Him. It's what the Bible says. It's a trust in Him. So I want to ask you to close your eyes. The band is welcome to come to the front. While your eyes are closed, I'm not going to make a big invitation this morning. I think there are thinking patterns that we've got to ask God to remove for us. But I'm trusting the Holy Spirit that he will reveal to you. While your eyes are closed, it is only you right now. You know. You know where you are in your faith and your trust in God. I believe that God has given me a mandate in this season to say they of church has got to raise the level of faith. What do you believe? What do you really believe about God? What he says?